Okay, we'll get started. I've started the recording and so happy to see so many of you familiar faces here and some, some new faces. Welcome. We're really excited to bring this panel of distinguished guests together for Navigating the Digital Divides, a strategic conversation on implementing the National Educational Technology Plan, NETP. A really hefty, comprehensive document created by U.S. Department of Education Office of EdTech uh, with collaborators, including CEDA and state leaders uh, across the nation. And today we have with us two from Michigan and North Carolina. So welcome all. Here's our agenda. We're going to meet the panel. I'll give you just a quick intro to the Go Open Network. And then we'll spend the time walking through the NETP, sharing some examples and hearing from state leaders. I have a few questions for everyone and then your questions. Uh, we'll save time at the end for that. So let's meet the panel. You can each introduce yourselves and I'll pass it first to Jisoo. Good afternoon, everyone. Ji Su Song, Digital Equity Advisor for the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education. Usually, I lead the work that falls underneath our digital equity and inclusion bucket of OET's priorities during this administration. But over the past year or so, I've had the privilege of supporting the development and rollout of the 2024 National Ed Tech Plan. So I'm excited to unpack that a little with you uh, today. I'll pass it back to Amy. Sarah. Sure. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Edson, project director with CETA, and I too had the privilege of working on the development of the National Ed Tech Plan with an extraordinary uh, team of project partners. And I'm excited to engage with you all uh, in our conversation today. Thanks, Amy, man. we can popcorn it to yeah, uh, please. Yeah, keep it moving. <laughs> Vanessa. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Vanessa Wren. I'm the chief information officer at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. And North Carolina has about 1.6 million students shared across around 2,800 schools in our state. And part of my purview in this role is I oversee all digital teaching and learning, um, certainly data and reporting and student information systems and anything that's an information system, modernization, et cetera. Um, and, and our work intersects with the National Ed Tech Plan in many ways. And I'll get to talk about that in a minute, um, but I'm delighted to be here with you all. Thanks, Gina. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Gina Lovelace. I am an educational technology manager at the Michigan Department of Education. Um, I went from a consultant to a manager and I haven't lost some of those um, job duties quite yet. We haven't replaced me. So I, I'm happy to say that I'm in charge of the back end of our OER um, repository that we have through ISKME. Uh, Go Open Michigan, awfully proud of some of that work. Um, also overview, or the, I oversee um, other staff around computer science standards and implementation, computational thinking, um, di digital skills, and E-rate. Thank you. And I'm Amy Evans-Godwin, Senior Advisor at ISKME. I also help facilitate the Go Open Network. And ISKME is an uh, education nonprofit based in California dedicated to open education and making teaching and learning more equitable, participatory, and open. If you don't know us, the Go Open Network has been around a while, and we are now, I would say, the only uh, organization dedicated to K-12 OER advancement. It was um, an amazing six years under the Department Department of Education Office of Ed Tech that brought together under a federal initiative states and districts to commit to OER. And when the department stepped away from it being a federal initiative and handed a uh, baton to ISKME who had been a partner since 2018, we wanted to keep it alive with um, an educator uh, participation, develop a community network governance and a centralized hub to share knowledge. And over the last two years, we've done things like initiating policy action to connect OER to digital equity because there's so many synergies there and to offer 
free OER professional learning to educators across subjects. And as we go forward, we're looking at some of the strategic actions that we can further target, including things that are that are highlighted in NETP for practice and policy. And now I will hand it to Jisoo. Let me just stop sharing for a second and, and let you have a uh, share. There we go. Zoom updated. I don't know <laughs> if that's happened on uh, folks' end. So like, I didn't even realize how much I associated different icon shapes with different functions. So it's getting a little bit uh, of time. It's taking a little bit of time for me to get used to it. So sorry for a little bit of a delay, but um, yeah. So I'll go into what the National EdTech plan is and what its purpose is and what it calls for before handing it off to our other speakers. Um, so the National EdTech plan, we sort of lovingly refer to it as the Department of Education's flagship policy document on topics related to EdTech. It really sets a national vision for what we mean by the phrase effective use of EdTech for teaching and learning. And it serves to provide some system level recommendations for how we can arrive at that vision. Um, this is not our first go at the NETP. Uh, this policy document has a significant amount of history behind it. Um, in the 90s, when the internet was just getting up and running, Congress was curious, how do we take advantage of this really cool tool you know, in our uh, classrooms, right? Um, so it uh, passed some legislation calling on the Department of Education to develop a long-range strategic plan examining how we can leverage technology for teaching and learning. So the first iteration of the NETP came around in 96. And then since then, a lot has happened in the field of ed tech. So we've had the privilege of updating it. Um, usually every administration or so, this one took a little bit of a delay because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we were excited to be uh, coming out with the 2024 NETP during this administration. And before I dive into the content, um, just wanted to share that the NETP has garnered a significant amount of national attention since it's released three months ago at the White House. Uh, and we've been trying to make sure that our office is represented at engagements like this one to make sure that it reaches our intended audiences, those system level leaders that the NETP makes recommendations to. And thankfully, the document has been received well by the field from various organizations and associations representing different sectors. Um, one common thread that we've seen folks really like is the emphasis on teachers and not deploying technology just for the sake of deploying technology, which we all as folks in the ed tech field understand the importance of. So let's dive into the NETP's core concepts. And to help you do so, I want you to imagine this scenario. And if you've been to recent OET presentations, you may have heard about this example before. So it'll be a nice review if you've heard about Jane the student. But imagine there's an eighth grade student sitting in their science classroom, right? Let's call her Jane uh, for today's uh, fictional example. And today, the science classroom is learning about forces, energy systems, motion, typical eighth grade science topics, right? Um, she's been given a textbook to read about those concepts. And next week, the teacher is going to give a quiz about some of the items in that textbook, right? Or maybe Let's give a technology-based example. You know, maybe Jane attends a one-to-one -one school, and the concepts are included as part of the online textbooks that's integrated into a district-wide learning management system, right? Maybe it's part of Canvas, maybe it's part of PowerSchool, right? The student has a reading disability. Jane has a reading disability that has her reading a little bit below grade level, so she's frustrated with the task that she's been given, struggling to understand the concepts in the online textbook, and she's growing anxious and worried about the quiz next week. So this situation um, faced by the student, you know, it's not unique to this fictional example, right? It illustrates three digital divides that form the backbone of the 2024 NETP, uh, those abuse design and access. So I'll go through each of them and examine how they show up in the case of Jane. So the first divide that the NETP talks about is the digital use divide, which exists between students who are asked to use technology in much more active ways versus students who are asked to use technology in more passive ways, passively consuming content, right? 
this divide I feel like was really made um, apparent during the pandemic when teachers had to really rapidly shift paper and pencil based uh, assignments into an online format. And research from the last several years indicates that students from marginalized backgrounds are especially likely to be impacted by this divide. And in the National Ed Tech Plan, we you know, note that in some cases, even when a school or a district or system you know, may have more access to you know, physical technology compared to peers, students within that system may still be only subject to passive uses of ed tech. So let's think about Jane again. Even though she may have access to an online textbook by a internet connected device, the learning experience itself, if you think about it, is still very passive, right? The expectation is to still absorb content from uh, a static piece of you know, online textbook and sort of regurgitate it back out in a multiple choice quiz setting. So the NETP recommends several actions to bridge this divide. First, beginning with the end vision in mind, you know, we need to know where we wanna go first. So how do we develop a portion of a graduate that lays out our expectations around what competencies, what skills we want students to leave the K-12 systems with. And then on top of that, you know, supporting students in becoming co-designers of their learning experiences, how do we provide them with some agency in how they learn so that they are more likely to be engaged? And then implementing measures of success that are aligned with those goals. Are we talking with our students about their experiences as a learner? Are we taking an audit of the instructional activities in our classrooms? to see if they only leverage uh, passive experiences or we're moving the conversation over to those active experiences as well. The second uh, divide that the NETP talks about is the digital design divide. And this is the unequal access to training and support and professional development opportunities for teachers in integrating ed tech into their practices, right? And the NETP also encourages a focused attention on the UDL framework, the universal design for learning framework in that professional development, right? Um, I think a lot of folks in the education world are by now familiar with UDL, but um, it's a research-based framework that was built with the needs of students with disabilities in mind, but we believe it can be a really powerful tool uh, to create some personalized learning experiences for all students. Um, it calls for providing multiple modes of representation, engagement, and expression. And we know as educators that technology can serve as a really powerful vehicle in uh, providing those multiple modalities, right? So going back to Jane, um, the learning goal was to understand those eighth grade science concepts, forces, motion, energy systems. How might technology have been used to provide different ways of representing, engaging, and assessing, right? instead of just like a static piece of online textbook, maybe she could have provided with different multimedia to engage with the content. Maybe even with her reading disabilities, one of her greatest assets is her capacity for creativity. So instead of demonstrating her learning through a quiz, maybe she could have you know, met those concepts through you know, a presentation, a video, a simulation, something else that leverages technology as a vehicle. Right. And then on top of that was her teacher you know, provided PD to use UDL as a foundation for her instruction. So those key actions, again, um, that the NETP calls for to bridge the digital design divide, you know, sustained attention to PD that's not just one and done, not just a 30 minute, you know, tool training, but something that's ongoing and a job embedded, um, and then a focused attention to frameworks like UDL in that professional development, right? How do we help teachers in becoming those informed designers of active learning experiences that are grounded in um, UDL? And then the third piece is the digital access divide. And I think this is the term that folks most often think about when they hear the term digital divide. This is the inequitable access to high speed kind of Is Jisoo frozen for others? Yes. And it's, it's a timely glitch, right? Right as we're oh. talking about digital access. <laughs> Our access, ah. <laughs> Let's see if he pops back in. Yeah, he lost sharing. Do you want to see if you want to share there, Sarah? Yeah, sure. Oh, there he is. I just see him. I don't know what happened. I Connectivity. Got disconnected. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as I was talking. Oh, no. <laughs> 
I'm we're so laughing. sorry about that. We're laughing with you, Jisoo. I promise, not at you. No, <laughs> you're totally fine. Where did I sort of drop off? Digital right. access, access slide right before key actions. Okay. <laughs> the irony of it all, right? <laughs> My gosh. Here we go. All right. So digital access to buy inequitable access to high speed connectivity, quality devices, and digital content, as I seem to be facing this afternoon. <laughs> um, but also including accessibility and a discussion around digital health, safety, and citizenship, right? Um, so going back to Jane, um, hopefully you haven't forgotten about her in the 10 seconds I was offline, but um, does she have access to assistive technologies that may help her engage with text-based content? Could her district have uh, updated their procurement policies and practices so that they set some baseline expectations around the accessibility of their tools? How could third-party seals and validations have been really helpful here? if they don't have um, capacity to vet, them, vet those tools themselves. And then she may have access to various tools from school, but what about from home, right? Is she connected when she leaves the school building? So the key actions that we discussed in the NETP in our discussion of um, the digital access divide, continued focus on equitable access to connectivity, devices, and content, building baseline expectations of accessibility features, and then developing clear expectations around um, digital health safety and citizenship education. So a major goal for, the OE, for OET this year is to ensure that the NETP can serve as a catalyst for action at the state and district level. So to help with that, I'm going to pass it to Sarah uh, to talk about some of the examples that are embedded throughout the NETP. All right, thank you so much, Jisoo. Um, I'm really excited to be here with you all today because personally, this is one of my favorite parts of the NETP, it's the stories. And as the project team was researching and gathering stories to show examples of progress, advancement, and success, it made me just want to plan a, a cross country. to be able to see themselves uh, in, in these examples so that they too can envision success and take steps towards that. Uh, and I also just wanna thank uh, Zach Chase at the Office of EdTech for helping to curate some of these examples. So uh, do you soon, next slide and we'll dive right in. So um, this is a really cool example uh, that reflects progress in closing the digital use divide. So there was uh, an elementary school in Atlanta, Georgia and some fifth graders uh, were noticing that a nearby community garden was being infested with insects that was damaging what was growing in the garden. Uh, and so they the class took this on as a real world kind of design thinking project that integrated technology for the students to work together to develop some solutions. So using some augmented reality and VR technology and 3D design tools in their Tinker Lab, they did one of the coolest things ever. They designed and built bat houses because they discovered there was a species of bat that would eat the insects and thus provide some protection for the garden. So they actually went, and I'm sure there was a wonderful iterative process, uh, and the students in their own hands-on way built these bat houses and then were able to see the, the real world effects of their design uh, and the efficacy of the solution that they came up with together. So this was a wonderful example of actively using technology, solving real world problems and doing it collaboratively. And as I said, I just wanna take a road trip to that school to see those bat houses in person because they sound like the coolest things ever. Next slide, please. All right, um, I mentioned that we, we include in the plan a really powerful example from the juvenile justice system. So there were researchers at Arizona State University uh, in the Oregon Research Institution who wanted to explore ways to reduce rates of recidivism for folks who were in the juvenile justice system. And they specifically wanted to explore whether technology integration had a positive, negative, or neutral effect on those rates of recidivism. So what they did was they designed solutions and they brilliantly did it by mapping things to the instructional core 
that being the teacher, the student, and the content. content. So they set up a system where the students were getting technology integrated educational experiences and some cognitive uh, restructuring. And it was uh, designed to happen over a long term. It wasn't like a one and done kind of workshop, but it was a thoughtfully designed technology integrated educational system for students uh, in this system. And a, a really powerful result that came out of a non-randomized comparison study after uh, the, the period of experimenting with this pilot showed, quote, the comparison group, so folks that did not have this technology infused learning experience had a significant, and by significant, I mean a 201% greater odds to recidivate two years post-release from the facility. So incredible data that shows a well-designed technology supported learning experience can have a tremendous impact on students' learning, their well-being, uh, and their chances for success uh, once they leave the school walls. Next slide, please. So next, um, we've just got a couple of examples of progress in closing that digital design divide. Um, and again, this is the one where we're looking at the, the systems that provide teachers with adequate time, support, and resources to learn how to effectively design uh, learning experiences with technology. We, we intentionally didn't focus on individual teachers because we know that it's really the systems that need to be well designed in order to support those teachers for success. So the first one comes from Colorado, where they were discovering what many of us have uh, experienced firsthand, which is that one and done kind of PD just doesn't have the lasting impact uh, that we want for professional learning experiences with our educators. So Denver Public Schools moved to a, a, a year long kind of longitudinal, again, thoughtfully designed PD program for their teachers. Um, and they were smart because they involved the teachers unions as well as the administrators and there was uh, compensation that was agreed upon. So they tackled this plan together. Initially, there were some lower rates of registration because we recognize how teachers plates are not just full but overflowing and I can imagine initially teachers go wait what more PD <laughs> with what time right. But eventually with with dedication and support and clearing things off some of the teachers plates. Uh, there were some really wonderful uh, results from this experiment, higher rates of completion, uh, increases in repeat registration, so teachers coming back for more, and teachers making deep and lasting connections with their professional learning coaches. So good stuff there. Next slide. And in Illinois, I like this example because it's kind of a continuation of the previous one. So for the folks in Illinois knew as well uh, as, as the previous state that that one and done PD model um, just doesn't work. It doesn't have the, the bang for the buck that you want it to. So uh, they too wanted to create a, a more longer term professional learning program for the educators in their state. But they recognized that smaller, medium sized districts don't necessarily have the staff on hand to be a full time instructional co coach nor do they necessarily have the funds in their budget to hire uh, an FTE to be in that role. So at, at the state of Illinois, they designed a, a, a cost sharing model where they were able to sort of pool instructional coaches from the state and districts were able to reserve time with those instructional coaches in a sharing capacity. So uh, they also saw some incredible results. And, and again, the, the impact of that longer term thoughtfully de designed uh, professional learning experience produced uh, much greater results than the have someone fly in for a one hour workshop, leave uh, never to follow up again. So that was a creative solution we, we love to be able to share. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so our last two examples uh, are from the access divide. Uh, so in the state of Missouri, they uh, had a powerful uh, period of progress after there was a student who was blind who joined a class and the, the school that the student was a part of found that they were not prepared to meet the student's learning needs when it came to technology. So they took a pause and said, you know, how can we how can we be better prepared to meet the needs of every single student, uh, regardless of what their needs are? So they thought, uh, again, very, very wisely that they should revisit their whole procurement process. 
and brought to the table an accessibility coordinator who is now permanently embedded in the procurement team. So kind of mirroring UDL as a framework, it should never be an afterthought. From the beginning, you want to design with all learners, especially those who've been in the margins. You want to center them and keep their needs uh, from the very beginning and not try to re retrofit things in. So now the district has not only been able to uh, find solutions for this individual student, but they're just developing the practice of focusing on accessibility from step one, uh, when, when you're considering what do our students need in order to be able to use these tools to do the learning that we've designed with them and for them. And so, um, yeah, again, this is just a great example of UDL in action, but not necessarily in the classroom. And it shows how that UDL framework and embracing it and using it in your professional practice can support state leaders, district leaders, uh, anybody in the education ecosystem. Next slide, please. Okay, last example here for now. Um, we wanted to spotlight the state of Delaware who has been building media literacy into their state standards. I think a, a lot of folks recognize that media literacy is absolutely critical, digital li literacy, you know, we're giving kids the keys to the vehicles, um, but not providing them with comprehensive and valuable driver education is gonna result in chaos and, and even potentially harm. So what the state of Delaware has done is built in media literacy into their state standards, which that act alone emphasizes the importance of media literacy education and ensures that every student in that state will have access to it. One of the reasons, again, that we're, we're including this in the access divide is that access divide historically has been um, thought to include access to devices, high-speed connectivity, and learning resources. That was pretty much the, the triumvirate for, for access. What the 2024 NETP does is says, yes, and we also need to make sure that if we're gonna close the access divide, we are considering accessibility and health, safety, and citizenship. So uh, we, we love that Delaware is putting this uh, up front and, and emphasizing the importance of it and making sure that it is a, a key component to closing that divide. All right, uh, and this next slide is I think my last one. So I want to highlight the story map that's available on OET's site. Uh, if you go to the NETP link, there's a link to the example map, the story map from there, but I also put the URL there on the slide. Um, they're just wonderful stories. You can fall down the rabbit hole and spend many, many minutes just learning all the creative solutions people are doing across the country. So I would encourage you to check that out uh, as you revisit the 2024 NETP. And uh, thank you for letting me speak about this section. And I will hand it over. Thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, but go ahead, Vanessa. Well, hi, so I loved hearing those stories and um, it's very um, encouraging to hear those stories and how we are mapping to those and what we're doing in the state of North Carolina. So when the National Ed Tech Plan came out, um, we, well, well, let me back up a minute. In North Carolina, we've had a digital learning plan literally since about 2008. A very robust plan um, where we looked at how we can equalize the playing field. And we were, that was back in the days when we first put this out, uh, think race to the top, and we were moving towards digital. Our focus was, you know, certainly connecting our schools to high speed internet and fiber to every classroom. Well, flash forward to 2024. Uh, we are on version three of our North Carolina digital learning plan and um, where we truly are looking at a growth model and how we use everything in our digital learning plan to meet the needs of all of our educators and our students and certainly have expanded the areas. So when the NETP came out, one of the first things that we did was to crosswalk the recommendations. And I took a screenshot here, it's several pages long and it's certainly a work in progress. We are not finished. Um, the crosswalk, our North Carolina digital learning plan, which is our framework um, for what we're doing um, with anything ed tech in our state and in our schools and looking at where we align and then what our needs are and then and where, where are our gaps. So almost like a fit gap analysis, if you will, and, um, and then what resources we're going to need to do that. So as part of this work, we plan on creating a profile of an educator for North Carolina. 
Um, one of the things that we we think about is in North Carolina, we have many state state provided managed and shared services. Um, and one of those is our OER. And we launched our OER in 2000 through the spirit and lens of digital equity for all of our educators. So if you're in the most rural part of our state or in the metropolitan part of our state, wealthy, low wealth, um, you still have access to quality resources. We are proud to say as part of this digital roadmap, we have run fiber to every single school, even out in our islands in North Carolina. And um, so making sure that those digital resources are there as well um, is part of this lens. We are looking at how we might need to revamp to fully incorporate the recommendations of the NETP. Um, certainly we aligned and have been doing this for a while, but we've seen areas that we can grow. Um, and one of the things that we've done and how we've so well embedded this has been ongoing, sustained, embedded professional learning. And one of the to look at now, right, we've, we've spent a very organic movement to where, you know, in the beginning, we used to talk about digital migrants to digital natives, and we were just technically upskilling people. We've gone much past that now where we're looking at time to plan and deep dive. So we have several cohort models that are available um, that are year long for all of our staff and our support staff. Um, we have cohorts around coaching and school library media. We have cohorts around AI. We did release some AI guidance back in um, February and uh, the generative AI has certainly been one of the rule tools that we're looking at that can truly help us finally capture what personalized learning can be and equip teachers in that area of personalized learning. Um, so, so how we cross out with that is this. So I, I would love to share more when we have our document totally finished because I think we're up to 20 pages now just looking at where we align with the recommendations um, and then how we revamp our OER as a, as a result. We are a single sign-on state where we provide a statewide SIS, statewide OER, statewide LMS, statewide instructional improvement systems. So how we connect those resources and ensure that we're growing those resources um, to, to keep moving towards total quality is where we focus. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Uh, we, we can stop sharing. Uh, I, I'm going to pass it now to Gina to uh, give us some highlights from Michigan. Thanks, Amy. So, so my, bringing in the NETP and um, starting to talk with some of our groups around the state, um, I think we've heard definitely loud and clear at the department, not one more thing. And I'm sure that a lot of you hear the same Thing, not one more thing. So we're we're being very intentional about trying to tackle the the part of the NETP that we're looking at making a large impact. I've got there are groups that are tackling some of the dig, the digital use um, divide. There are groups doing some of the digital access dis, um, work, and so our office is actually looking at that digital design divide and redefining professional development for our teachers. Um, we have uh, money in the state that allows districts to have some literacy coaches and some math coaches. Um, we were fortunate enough this past year to have legislation passed. So we have some districts that are implementing um, computational thinking and computer science coaches in their districts. And this is something that is new and we're super excited because we see um, we're kind of going as computational thinking as kind of a precursor into uh, computer science. And we see how this really aligns super well with the NETP also bringing in our um, teacher prep institutions into that conversation. So we're not designing something around professional development opportunities for the new and the veteran teachers. We're, we're working with those incoming teachers as well. So we're, we're super excited about this work. It's in year one um, where we hope that we continue to get um, some more money for districts around these initiatives. Um, it looks good, but you know, we know how that goes. It's budget season. Um, one day it's in and the next day it's out. So um, we just hope that it, it ends up in. And um, if not, we'll find another way around some of that and keep, keep up some of that work. Awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you all of you for the inspiring examples to hear where this work is already happening and well underway. Uh, I had a question about whether, uh, and maybe start first with Jisoo, that the, the three divides are challenging. Is there is there one that we're seeing is particularly challenging? Is there a, a significant uh, challenge that NETP is is addressing that you'd like to highlight? This question's like, you know, having to choose your favorite child, right? <laughs> but um, when we were developing the 2024 uh, NETP, we looked at the goals that were set in the very first NETP. Um, and I think we met a lot of those goals, especially on the access piece when it comes to connectivity in our school buildings. Obviously, a connectivity from home is another piece that our, our colleagues over at the Department of Commerce and the FCC are tackling. But when we look at the very first NETP, one goal that we haven't met is the one on ensuring that educators receive support and preparation um, to leverage technology for active learning, right? So the design divide does stick out to me. Um, this is backed up by some recent data that shows teachers are not getting uh, the professional development that they that they say they want when it comes to emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, right? So I think there are several system level solutions we can think about to solve this issue, right? Um, again, going back to uh, what the NETP talks about, with starting with the end vision in mind, how do we create a portion of an educator that aligns to the state's or district's portion of a graduate so that we can examine how you know, technology can serve as a tool to accelerate sound instructional practices. Um, my low, I, can you hear me better now? Much better, thanks. Okay, I think my microphone was at my chin. I apologize about that. Um, and then the role of states, you know, recognizing that, you know, districts might be stretched in terms of budgeting and capacity uh, dedicated for ed tech coaches. You know, Sarah pointed out that example from Illinois, who have engaged in partnerships with their districts to essentially loan out um, coaches based on needs, right? So exploring models like those. And then rethinking how we fund, you know, ed tech PD so that there's a focus attention on um, research frameworks like UDL. You know, federal grants like Title IIA and Title IA of the Every Student Six Seeds Act can fund professional development on ed tech. And while there's a time and place for it, using these funds to solely focus on tool training um, at the scale that ed tech, uh, ed tech is being used by students and educators is almost a losing battle. So, you know, how do we coach educators on research-based design principles like UDL so that they have agency to select tools uh, and appropriately uh, build active cohesive learning experiences that are that have UDL as the foundation. So the design divide sticks out to me. All three require dedicated attention, but looking at the goals that were you know, set in 96 and seeing where we gone, I feel like you know that's an issue that's ongoing. And I know states and districts have put forth a lot of different efforts uh, to make sure that that's being bridged. So appreciate the work coming out of um, both uh, Michigan and uh, North Carolina. That's great, thank you. I think I'll move to the next question about uh, the NETP is very intentional about including portraits or profiles of what educators uh, skills can they can take on to uh, really support and connect to student learning. Uh, Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit more about what struck me? My first read of the, the plan was how much UDL was highlighted, and that seems to be something that is embedded. So many educators have taken on, it on, but maybe many have not and are just going to get started. Do you want to comment a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were we were excited to uh, incorporate UDL as much as we could in the NETP. Um, and I want to echo what was said earlier, which is the sentiment, uh, not just on the part of educators, but on school staff and state leaders, right? Not another thing. And some folks have heard about UDL, they're familiar with it conceptually, but if it's be, if they're being asked to consider UDL, they might think, oh my gosh, is this another thing? Is this another fr framework? Is this perhaps a fad? There might be some folks who, who just haven't been practically uh, embedded in the work of applying UDL in action. So I think there's a, a challenge there to, to make sure people understand what it is and practically how you can use it and how eventually it's, it's not something that you're adding on, but it's a framework and a lens that you use in your work, whatever your hat is in the education ecosystem. 
So I would I would connect it with the portraits, right? We've we've mentioned a few times the recommendations to develop clear portraits of a learner or a student, clear portraits of a learning environment, uh, and and portraits of an educator. So you paint that picture of success. Folks know sort of that common target to which you're moving. And then I see an opportunity to connect UDL to those portraits. So if you have your portrait of a student and your portrait of a learner, you can think back to Jane, the example, and her unique needs. And you can think about the multiple ways that that portrait of a learner can manifest itself. So how can we design learning environments and how can we design systems from which teachers emerge who know how to creatively leverage the myriad resources that we have available today to make every student able to access the learning in front of them. Um, I know I just sort of wove together a lot of words, but I, I really see a powerful connection between defining success through those portraits, then considering the multiple avenues to engage, assess, and give a chance to demonstrate learning, and then to learn more with practical guidance about how folks regardless of their role, can leverage UDL and can think about it in practice just throughout their day. So it just becomes part of their lens and their mindset. Um, I'll pause there because I want other panelists to be able to chime in if they have thoughts. I, I can say when I saw the NETP, I thought, um, I mean, obviously having OER in my background it was definitely like, well, the OER is right there because both of them speak so highly of the, the UDL side and the equity and the accessibility piece. So um, I think we said, someone said earlier, it may have been Jisoo in your example, like sometimes it's thought of after the fact and, and how do we change that professional learning so that teachers know um, when they're designing that learning experience for students, it's not the afterthought like, oh, is this going to work for everybody? It, it's at the beginning. Um, and I think the NETP does a really nice job in OE, creating those OER resources and sharing them and having them in space that, that um, you don't have to go Google the, just the right keywords to find it. You go to a repository and you find those, uh, those resources at your fingertips in a tenth of the time. So um, one of the things in the NETP that really stood out to me was that um, so in one of the pages it talked about teachers being able to use a tool for a lesson and then designing a lesson that uses the tool and how different those skills are and recognizing that when you're designing professional learning for educators will then transfer into designing learning experiences for our students. So OER was just laced in all of that. It might not say, and then create an OER resource around this. It, it doesn't say it maybe that bluntly, but it's there. I'm just gonna add one piece to that. You know, universal design for learning is just like innovation. You know, I tell all of my team members and what I mean, you, you can't have a director of innovation or someone doing it. Innovation is everyone and everything we do. And the same thing is with UDL, right? We've got to embed it in all the materials that we make, all the, it has to be at the first part, part of the roadmap from the beginning. And, um, and if you're not approaching it that way, then you're going to go back and try to re retrofit. And I think that's where it gets confused with accessibility. Um, certainly, it is much broader and more than the accessibility. And um, being the lens, and I think it was stated earlier, being the lens of all the work we do, then creates it at the forefront where it's not just one more thing. It's built in and, um, and as, as should be innovation. So all of those pieces work together. That's great. Let's dig into that a little bit from Gina and, and Vanessa. You you both ha very have a focus lens on OER and open education and where the benefits are. Um, where do you see uh, that connection uh, in the work that you're doing to have embedded uh, PD practice, not one-offs, uh, that teachers really can think of themselves as designers of materials? And the, the plan even mentions students as co-designers. How does this overlap with some of the work that you're doing with open education? Well, I'll just say it overlaps North Carolina with our own going PD. Um, we realize it's never once and done, that it's always taking the educator and growing them and having consistent support. For North Carolina, all of these divides resonate. 
But certainly the design divide is the one that we are on, ongoingly focusing on, particularly post-pandemic. We've got an influx of digital tools, an influx of computers, um, and but then not the human capacity at the school level to support and the way it needs to be supported to get to um, the full recommendations of UDL and the recommendations inside the NETP. So what, what we've approached with that is, and I, and I mentioned this earlier, our own going per PD. We do statewide road shows in the summer where we've really expanded that and you know touch many, many educators. We also know that we want to revamp our OER. We have about 150,000 educators in the state, but we got 38,000 that consistently log in and use the OER. And so we are asking the question, why is that? We know there's good things in there. We know that teachers can highly recommend some of those resources. Um, certainly we want to work to make um, to make high quality instructional materials readily available for all of our areas. But going back and looking at those metrics, we're missing part of our constituents. And uh, so that's one of the ways that we're gonna go back and take a look, but certainly access to professional growth. Another piece that we did to ongoingly support that was not just with the OER, but memberships to other places. In North Carolina, we provide every educator a membership to ITSE. We provide every ed tech or media person memberships to COSIN. Um, we also um, make sure that everyone gets trained on our Go Open platform and the lesson plans and the templates that are in there. Uh, and again, it has to be embedded ongoing training. What we're seeing, and this is somewhat concerning as budgets now tighten with the ESSER Club, some of those support people can't continue. So how do we fill in that gap and how do we make sure that even though we've been doing all of these things and we continue to do these things, we want to make sure that the the digital instruction is truly rich, truly engaging, and it's not sit and get for the student. So I love hearing, and I would like to see more about how students can partner in that. I think generative AI and how we are rolling that out where that can be a partnership with a teacher and a student um, is also very promising for what we'll see in the future as well. That's great, Gina. Um, similarly, what, what do you hope to see uh, as this rolls out, what would you like to see in the future, given Michigan has lots of platforms and tools, and to, including Go Open Michigan? Uh, where do you see some of this work going and, and whether the challenges or uh, solutions uh, are uh, something that you hope OER might be able to address? Yeah, I'm going to um, very quickly birdwalk a quote that a CETA friend of mine made recently at the COSIN conference, um, and she's here. So if I mutilate it too bad, she can correct me. So Julia, um, I, I did everything I could not to stand up and go, yeah, when she said it on stage. So she was speaking specifically of um, tools and ed tech tools and how for years we've had ed tech tools, they pretend to be, you know, the, the magic bullet and they're wonderful and everything and how that conversation is now going to change. Like, what's the research behind that ed tech tool and how is it really helping kids? And I frame that that way because how are we going to have our teachers framing? How are we framing that PD and those resources that are, are going to be OER licensed, that are we're going to be sharing around the state? And how are we going to weave that conversation in? Where's the research behind that? Show me the research. Um, so um, maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's better than show me the money. I don't know. But when, when Julia said that at the COSIN conference recently, I was just like, oh my gosh, there's, there's everything I'm thinking of around our professional development opportunities in our state. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me. I hope it wasn't too much of a bird walk for, for those of you that maybe didn't hear that. So, and if I mutilated that, Julia, have at it. Let me know. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Gina, is there anyone um, that has some questions for panelists? We'll open that up right now. Uh, I'll just share screen again, but um, happy to hear from anyone that wants to jump in or put it in the chat.
I'd be interested if anybody had their favorite quotes out of the NETP. I know that's a deep question. <laughs> I, I There's like three or four. I th I've mentioned a couple. Um, Go but ahead. I'm gonna throw one or two in the chat as well. I, I, what, what really sticks out? We have some super knowledgeable people in, in, the, in our audience. I know that maybe you have some examples where some of these activities meant to transform teaching and learning in your state and your setting uh, have already been implemented or things that you're finding particularly challenging. Let's see, I have something from Dan. Where is OER mentioned as more than an anecdote in NETP? Maybe a comment. Can I take actually a stab at, at yes. Dan's question? Please, so, Julia. One thing that we really want folks to understand, and I, I'm also like feeling like I'm speaking on behalf of OET, that the NETP really is a framework or a vision for what we imagine teaching and learning to be, right? What we want to see in our classrooms and, and what we need to be focused on in order for that vision to come to life. OET and the rest of ed also have other um, more in-depth um, guidance or um, resources for you to kind of dig in. So if you notice, I mean, AI is everywhere, like COSIN, I mean, was more at ASU GSV was AI everywhere, but they have the AI guide. So we didn't really go deep into it. So it's the same sort of thing with OER. We're not gonna go deep into all of those areas with the NATP. It wasn't done necessarily as an omission, but it was more like there's other places where you can be connecting then those resources to the NETP versus us trying to call out. UDL has been, you know, it's in law as part of ESSA, and we wanted to really call it out as a way for folks to really approach um especially that design divide, how they could really close that gap by something that's out there that has also been out there for 40 years. I mean, it may have been enacted in 2015 for us to actually use it, but that framework has been in play for 40 years. And we really want to make sure that um, we highlight that this is for all students. It, it's not just for students um, over here that may have an IEP or some other supports that they need. Really, if we use that lens of UDL, we can actually realize the full potential of the NETP in the design space. Yes, thanks for that, Julia. That's really what uh, motivated us to have this webinar, to make that connection. There's a lot of uh, parts of transforming education that sometimes OER may be a footnote or an afterthought. Uh, including other aspects of UDL, like accessibility. Sometimes people are not putting that in the forefront of their planning, but there's so many connections to make. Uh, it, similarly with digital equity, uh, OER have, may not be the first thing that comes to mind, but it certainly is about equity at its core. Let's see. I like your quote, Gina, about... Um, See. learning principles should drive the use of emerging tech. I think we're really hearing that. We often uh, are in a phase of a flurry of procuring ed tech and then assessing whether it has um, impact and value and going into it first to, to know whether something's gonna be effective is, is really great as far as saving effort and money. Anyone else want to comment about where we're going with what we're seeing now with um, ed tech's assessment? I see you also commented PD should include the time and support that teachers need to build capacity with tools. Different for every person, yeah. We do it for our students. We don't always do it for our educators. But that sounds like a good example story somewhere where somebody that does, because I know it's not everywhere. I, 
I'd, I'd love to see that example. It might be in one of the states. You know, I'd like to chime in and talk about um, teacher prep programs too. Oftentimes we talk about the, the teachers and we talk about the students, but our professors that are teacher prep programs, if they're not comfortable with technology, it's really hard for them to guide and encourage our, our you know, future educators how to use technology to build with UDL and to, and to build dynamic interactive lessons with student voice as well. This is what I have bumped into a lot on how do we help address our professors at our ed tech, at our, at our teacher prep programs to become more comfortable with technology to be able to do some of what we're talking about here. Can I pop back on? Because I'm Gina, Please. probably heard me say this out loud. Yeah. And after I said it, I was like, oh, I hope people don't think that I'm kind of bagging on teachers, but we live in a modern society. Our profession has not modernized it. You, I don't think teachers have the luxury of saying, if they, if they go through the UDL process and they realize that a non-tech um, strategy is the way to go, that's great. But they need to go through that process to get there. So I don't think they have the luxury of saying, well, I'm only going to do it the way that I know it because they're professionals. And if I am picking a doctor to pick out, you know, like to take out my gallbladder, I certainly want the one that's probably going to use the more high tech stuff stuff so that they're less evasive than the one that will do it the old way and, and everything else. Every single sector has modernized and as a sector we haven't. And I think we need to hold the our professionals, right? Including those prep programs that are preparing those professionals to be at a higher standard of, of preparing them to be in a space where that we are using modern tools and modern strategies and modern things to reach you know what I mean? To teach and teach and learn. I don't know how else to say that. I just don't want it to come off as, you know, I'm telling educators they're not doing a great job because I think they are given where they are and what they have and the constraints in the system. But really, I, as a sector, we have to modernize. Otherwise, it's it, it, even in classrooms, you talk about, you know, I can have biology 101 and I have a great teacher that's doing all this stuff. But if I happen to, by algorithm, get put into the classroom next door and they're not, like there's an there's an inequality right there happening in a in this building. Forget about the district next door; it's in the building. So how do we elevate the profession as a whole, but have them learn the process to go through? Saying I understand why I'm not using technology in this in this instance, or I know it's more appropriate, and they can explain that. Julia, I'll just add one sentence and connects uh, some earlier comments. That what you've just been saying, I think, paints the picture for the need to use UDL for teachers to center their students, not their preference for a teaching a style, but then those that support the teachers need to center the needs of the teachers as they design the system in which the teachers operate. So that way, when the teachers are centering the students, it's not like a, should I, or do I prefer to? Like they're centering the needs and matching the right tool uh, for the task and the student. And then the folks that are designing the systems in which the teachers operate need to center the needs of the educators uh, and the students, of course. I'll say I'm, thank you for that made me, sorry. I, I would say, yeah, I'm just gonna have to ping in because- Julia Please do, our last start. minute, yeah. Vanessa, thanks. There has got to be some accountability, right? With our EPPs, we, like, like Julia said, we've really been talking about this for a long time. And certainly we've seen our, our educator evaluation systems embrace some of this, but I don't believe they've gone far enough and the accountability of our EPPs have not gone far enough either. And uh, so I think that's one of the things that we have to look at because we have to we have to serve our children. And we're talking about closing the digital divides. We've got to get to the root of what's what's um, stagnating maybe some of the growth. So I'll stop right there. Thank you. That's a perfect ending. Thank you. Uh, these are really the, the, our, our big our big picture thoughts that we're going to be aiming for uh, been, and trying to get there and close these gaps and divides. And I think the NETP lays this out very clearly where, where our work needs to be. So thank you for being here. We'll make this recording available, the slides available, and you can reach us uh, on email, go to our hub, share resources, find resources, and find us on social media and our newsletter to continue this conversation. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming, everyone.
And thank you to Vanessa and Gina for representing states. I appreciate it. Y'all are rock stars. <laughs> thank you.